John, you're so clearly not qualified. It's gotten into your head where you think you can just speak about anything and somehow your opinion is right over the yeah. actual data of the topic that you're critiquing. Yes. My mind is yes. blown. <laughs> All right, friends, welcome back. Another uh, response video. I, I will say, I know some people might think that we're kind of picking on Allie because, like, because I, I just did a response to her a few weeks ago, but I've had this one in the works, at least in my mind for a while now. And when I finally reached out to Dr. Laura, who's our guest today, she was like, how soon can we do it? And I said, well, don't let me hold you up. So we're doing this one kind of in uh, succession to our previous response. Um, before we go forward, let's introduce our guest, Dr. Laura Anderson. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks for making time. It means so much. Yeah, it is so good to be here. This video, oh my God, I'm so excited to be talking about it. I wish I would have live re like done a recording of a live reaction the first time I watched it when you <laughs> sent it to me. Uh, I was on a video call with a good friend of mine who's also a therapist. We watched it together oh, and good. our faces were like jaw dropped the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Well, you, you you have written at least one book. Have you written more than one? So technically, I guess I've written two, but one of them is like a manual specifically for therapists on how to work with religious trauma. That was the first book that I wrote while I was getting my PhD. And Got then it. I did write my other book, which is When Religion Hurts yes. You, Healing from Religious Trauma and the Impact of High Control Religion, which came out in October of 2023. And that's available wherever you purchase books. So, and you were yeah. a guest on the show before for that book. So if folks want to yes. find it, I don't think it's on YouTube. I think it's on our podcast um, only right mm -hmm. now. But you can go back in the archives and find that. It was a great interview. Really quick, why don't you go ahead and just give us some of your credentials. Like give us your background and tell people why I tapped you for this video. Oh, because I'm a Christian counselor. That's no, right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we need a biblical perspective yeah. here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. OK, so I am I have a master's degree in marriage and family therapy. I'm a licensed psychotherapist in the state of Tennessee. Um, and I've been doing this for oh gosh, I've been licensed for like 13, 14, 15 years, something like that. I'm an approved supervisor through the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapists. I have a Ph.D. in mind body medicine. I'm a somatic experiencing practitioner. I I've got a lot of letters behind my name. Um, I've done, I've been a trauma specialist for God, 10 years now. I've got a ton of different credentials and certifications. Um, and that's what I study, like for fun. Yes. I read books. I <laughs> oh, you're one of do those? Things. You're one yeah, of those. Yeah, I know, right? I, like, I, I had I, a high school yeah, math yeah. teacher that would tell me for fun <laughs> she would do algebra. And I thought, what kind of <laughs> yeah. person are you that would do that for fun? So yeah, okay. I know, okay. I know. I and so, yeah. And like, <laughs> like my newest kind of weird passion is that I am taking the menopause board certification, uh, to become a menopause certified specialist to work wow. with women in that are going through this because of the correlation between early onset menopause and trauma, specifically for women coming out of fundamentalist systems. So it's like, that's what I do for fun. Yeah, I never so, made those connections until yeah. you said that, but that that is yeah. fascinating. Okay, yeah. what I hear yeah. you saying is <laughs> I got credentials, I love this yeah. stuff, and I have a yeah. long legacy of being in this space, which also tells me that you're up to date on the most recent literature when it comes to all these topics regarding yeah. mental health and anxiety and all the categories, right? Yeah. You know what's going on because this is your this yeah. is your field of expertise. Yeah, absolutely. It is something that I'm. I always try to stay up to date. I, I do the, you know, like Google Scholar is a wonderful thing that anybody can access, but yet we use it for research. So when I'm looking yeah. for what is the most up to date research in this video, he talks about three things in particular, PTSD, ADHD, and OCD. It is not hard for anybody, including John MacArthur, to look up what is the most available up to date research that we have. And I like to stay up to date on that because I yeah. think for myself in particular, it does a service to my clients and the people that I work with in online spaces to know, hey, what's being said out there, yes. as well as when I offer content to people and when I'm consulting with people and teaching people, like I, I want to make sure that I'm accurate in what I'm saying. I'm all about, we try right? our best on the show to bring on people who really know what they're talking about because they love it, right? That helps us mm -hmm. get a more informed understanding of the world as we understand it. So I'm glad to have you on the show and have you respond to this video. Before we get started on the video itself, I wanna set something up. One of my biggest 
qualms with Ali Stuckey, and I've had this now for a while with her, is about, I think almost now, was it two years ago, or, or maybe it was a year ago, I think it was two years ago, uh, a, a series of articles came out about John MacArthur. John MacArthur is mm. a pastor, he's one of the most well-known pastors in, in evangelical spaces, mainly white evangelical yeah. spaces, he's written dozens of books, he has his own version of the Bible with his commentary underneath of it, it's sold, uh, mm -hmm. I think, close to a million copies, so he's very prolific, he has his own seminary, and he has his own church called called Grace Community Church. So I say that mm -hmm. because maybe some people who are new to the show never heard that name before. In the world of evangelical fundamentalism, he kind of is the dude that's been around for yeah. a long, long time. Now, of course, with that comes so many issues, and we've covered this before. In fact, if you go back again on the podcast, not on YouTube, I did a, about a 35, 40 minute just deep dive on John MacArthur and my problems with him. So I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but here's what I will say. About two years ago, a series of stories came out about John MacArthur that there were at least two men, if not more, but most likely two men, who were paid pastors on his staff, both of which, of which SA'd their own children. One of them passed away, um, the other one is currently serving time in prison for what he did to his kids. That person, his name is John Gay. Um, he did all this, and John MacArthur and his church, instead of punishing and shaming the man, shamed the woman publicly instead for not going back to her husband. There's a whole story, there's a lot of layers to this. I'm kind of giving you the real big picture. It's atrocious. And by the way, the articles, and I'll try and put, make sure I, re I remember to put them in the show notes, have all emails, they have documentation, they have eyewitness, they have police reports. They're not just like a tabloid piece. Uh, the person who did this story, it's very detailed. So this story comes out. Ali Stuckey, who's a massive John MacArthur fan, does this video that is just honestly terrible. And I, I, I responded to it. In fact, if you go way back in our videos, you'll see it. I think it's called Ali Stuckey's Trash Take on John MacArthur. It has a real low quality <laughs> thumbnail, but it's there. And I essentially go through and I debunk her complete misreading of the story. So Ali Stuckey is also someone who loves to talk about, especially on Twitter, how we have to protect kids from quote unquote groomers, which of course we know is code for queer people. Mm -hmm. And she consistently mm -hmm. highlights stories of people that she doesn't like who have done terrible things uh, towards children and then uses that as a broad brush for all people groups that she doesn't like. What is so infuriating is watching her now do another interview with John MacArthur talking about mental health as if John MacArthur himself is not someone who has protected two men who have assaulted uh, and molested their own children. It, it, honestly, Laura, it, it, it boils yeah. my blood. It, it is mm -hmm. it is mind blowing to me that someone who can really think or who can really say with a straight face, protect kids, will then amplify Trump, which she does, um, or yeah. John MacArthur. So I had to get that off my chest. This is a red, I already have problems with both John and Allie. And now we're going to talk about the mental health aspect because John MacArthur's mental health advice, I'll let you be the expert there and yeah. you can tell me. But to me, it sounded pretty crazy. Well, and it's also worth noting that the first 46 or whatever minutes of this video is talking about protecting children. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Don't tell all, me that. It's oh. all about his new book on like the war on our children. Oh, that's or right. It's, yeah. <laughs> And I mean, like, and when I texted you about it the other day, I was like, I mean, there is 1000 conversations in that first 45 or so minutes, but it is the most transphobic, homophobic, patriarchal video. It is. Ter it's terrible. <sighs> right. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. she gets into this clip yeah. that we're going to be watching. So it's all on the heels of that. And so it's just I mean kind of, again, jaw dropping, the whole entire jaw dropping. it's awful. Yeah, okay. it's well, awful. Let, let, let's, let's get yeah. into it. It's about a three and a half minute clip we're gonna respond to. And Laura, mm -hmm. I gave you the rules ahead of time. You can tell me to pause whenever you want. I will smash yeah. that space bar and we'll unpack it. Um, I love it. And yeah, you know, maybe to your point, maybe I'll have to go through that full interview and then do a different kind of response to all the other nonsense. I mean, we, mm -hmm. I literally could build an, an, an entire channel just responding to Ali Stuckey's right. podcast guests because so many of them are just so honestly terrible. I'm not sure else to say it. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, anyway, it's pretty bad. Well, are you ready? Are you buckled in? Do you, do you have any blueberry coffee right. over there like I do? Mm. Okay, so, you know, on the topic Delish. of ADHD, yeah. <laughs> uh, what has not worked for me is peace, joy, patience. <laughs> what has worked for me is not only medication, but cutting out caffeine. Oh. I have not had coffee in forever. Maybe I so should I do have, that. 
I have my liquid IV. <laughs> okay. In, in 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 my in my water bottle. So here we fair go. Enough. Cheers All right. to that. Well, here we go, friends. If you're watching on YouTube, <laughs> I would love to see and read your comments as you're going through this. What do you think about the takes that you're going to hear from Allie and John? Let me know in the comments. All right, Laura. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. What are you talking about? There's no such thing as PTSD. There's no such thing as ADHD. Of course they are. I'm diagnosed with those things. Um, what, what do you say to that? So just to sum it up, uh, with a couple of clear foundational oh, truths. You know what? Let, let me just set okay. the stage real quick. Yeah, yeah. really briefly. My bad. I didn't do this. I'm not a good podcast host. John went viral a few months ago on Twitter for saying that there's no mm -hmm. such thing as PTSD, as OCD. In fact, we covered it in a previous uh, weekly recap with me and April Ajoy. So you can, mm -hmm. again, friends, you can go back in the YouTube or the podcast archive a few weeks ago and find that video. But that's what, what Ali is asking him about, essentially asking him to follow up on what he really meant yeah. by that. Is, is, is that a fair sum, uh, summation? Yeah, yes. And so he's kind of walking back that statement. But even what he just said there, I think is actually worth noting, because he starts out with this statement of here's a clear foundational truth, which I just want to be like, okay, clear foundational truth, according to who, right. But I think it this begs like a further, uh, maybe I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are. Like, okay, first of all, he, he does have a PhD, at least according to his Wikipedia page, it is a PhD in divinity. So he is, he does not have a PhD in um, ne neurology, psychology, right. therapy, anatomy and physiology, traumatology. He does not have any therapeutic background. He is not a therapist, no training in this whatsoever. And yet he is somebody who is speaking to mental health issues, therapeutic issues, issues of the brain and body. And as if he is an authority with somebody who has years, decades of experience working with people. I find this to be highly problematic. Let me just clarify something, because you're right. If you read online about him having, having a PhD, it's not really a PhD. Uh, here's what it says. In 1963, he was granted a Master's of Divinity from the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, New Talbot Theological Seminary, yeah. uh, with honors. And MacArthur was also given honoraria from Talbot oh, Theological Seminary. So he has, he, has, he has an honoraria. Is it honorarium? Okay. So yeah, so he yes, basically, he yes, it's, yeah. Okay, so then I have even less respect for yeah. him. Yeah. But as somebody who so has gone clear. through that process right. of actually getting a PhD. So um, Dr. John MacArthur, you are not a doctor. Right. So you have even less room to speak here. But I think that's really important because there is this idea that because he is a pastor, there is yes. extra credibility here. That's right, that's So right. what I say is now from God, which means right. you have to listen to me, even though it is so far outside of the scope of my knowledge. Um, I, as a therapist, um, I have a scope of knowledge. So if you're going to come to me and ask me about things, you ask me for my credentials. You don't have to listen to me on anything, but if you're going to listen to me, <laughs> right. it's right. in this box, right? So if you ask me about, say, cancer or right. oncology, don't listen to me. Right. I don't have experience. I don't have knowledge in that area. That would be really dumb of you to listen to me in that. So go talk to somebody who has that. Why are we listening to somebody just starting off? Why uh, does he think percent. that we should be listening to him? Because he's a faithful um, man of God, yeah. Laura, Avi. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> what is it? God, God equips those he calls, not not what is it oh, god god calls what is it, it god, god, god equips the call equips he, he doesn't the... call the equipped yeah, <laughs> yeah. all right we'll yeah keep, right we'll keep okay. it a moving we're 17 <laughs> seconds in we're off to a great start <laughs> exactly. here we go sick the brain can can be damaged you can have a tumor you can have encephalitis you can have a brain problem that's that's clinically manifest that can be diagnosed and that can be treated with medication and, and surgery for the brain. The mind is something completely different. The mind is transcendent. You can't- I would pause there. Okay, I'll pause, yeah. I'll pause. The mind is transcendent yeah. was what he ended with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so the floor he is, yours. is I, I would agree with him to an extent on this. Like, mm -hmm. yes, there are brain problems, traumatic ba brain injuries. What he's talking about there is, you know, what we see on like Gray's Anatomy, you right. know, Derek Shepard, neuros neurosurgeon, right? He's, that's what he's talking about. But if you look at the research, so 
the brain obviously is a structure. It is an organ. The mind is separate, but they are inseparable. And this Mm. is a whole conversation that we can have. And I think the crux of what this video is, because um, he's so he what he's talking about here. This is like dissertations worth of of information here. Um, But yeah, the brain and the mind are separate, but they are inseparable. And the mind literally impacts the structure of the brain. So first of all, I would be curious to know where he's getting this information because he he says a lot of times they say this or that or whatever. And I I want to know where where is this research? Right. So that I that's just that's a pet peeve of mine as a researcher myself. I want to actually know where you're getting this. But, you know, whatever. Um, But the brain. okay, so the mind is essentially energy. So this is going to be like our thinking, our feeling, our choices that creates thoughts that essentially shifts the structure of our brain because of neuroplasticity. So there's a, a law called Hebb's law. It's this idea that neurons in our brain that fire together, wire together. So the more that we think something or do something, the more that that becomes a subconscious, a, a pathway in our brain that creates a physiological response in our body. Does that make sense? Yep. I can explain more. Nope. This is what indoctrination is. This is what habits are uh, that comes from our mind, but it it happens through our brain. This is why we breathe without thinking, right? right? We don't have to consciously take a breath unless we're, you know, actually doing breath work. It's how our, our body's temperature is regulated. It's how all of our systems in our body, um, that happens through our brain, but our, our mind is connected to that. Yeah. But trauma (laughs) trauma, mental health issues, all of that, it happens in our brain as well. And our brain is changed due to a variety of different things that happen because of our mind, but also because of what's happened in our brain. So, I mean, yeah. What I'm hearing you say is it's it's very symbiotic. uh, Mm -hmm. And and they they both feed off of each other is kind of the vibe I'm hearing you say. Chicken and the egg. Yeah, they work together. Okay, yeah, that makes Mm -hmm. sense. All right, got it. Yeah. So he, I, I don't agree with him, but we can carry on. Okay, fair enough. I mean, <laughs> like, maybe I, I he's agree right that they're the separate. Of, yeah, and there, but, maybe there is something transcendent about, about the mind, but mm-hmm. it's, still, it's, still, it's still grounded somewhere in reality, right? It's still embodied somewhere in the brain. Yes. Is that a fair yes, way of putting but, it? I don't want to misrepresent anything. Yeah, I mean, the, like you can't um, like take the mind. You can take the brain out of our body, right? Yes, you we can do that. Hold the brain. You could not hold the mind like an right. organ, yes. right? Right. So I would agree with him when he says they're separate. But when you would go to like look at the research or something, you would say yes, they're separate, but they are inseparable. Yeah, also, that makes sense. And they and you wouldn't find like opposing research to one another, right? If that right. makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Mm-hmm. We'll keep it going. The yeah. mind with a chemical, you can wound the brain. And that's what's coming out now in psychiatry. You go back to Thomas Saz back in 1957, I think, when he wrote the book, (laughs) The Myth of Mental Health. Okay, pause. So here's like the one point where he's like, let's let's talk about the research. He does it later on in the video too, Bruce Levine. Um, Okay, 1957, dude, really? Mm. Like that's where you're gonna go to. Mm. I have a problem with that too. So. If that's where he wants to go back to with his one piece of research, like we're not the way that we understand mental health today is obviously very different than in the 50s. But take trauma just for an example, because he uses the PTSD example over and over in his his um, his talk, like how we understand PTSD. We're looking at research from the 1990s onward. Right. Um, we didn't use women in research prior to that point. And so how, how we understand trauma was very different from b- before 1992, hmm. uh, b- b- before that point. So when he's talking about this here, I would say there's a very kind of old school way even of how psychology just in general is understood. Yeah. Yeah. And most people in general, especially those in the psychological field, would say, I mean, that's great that you're pulling a name here, but these are very outdated concepts that you're talking about. That makes Um, sense. We have, you know, 
75 years of research past that point. Right. It would be, it would be like, you know, to put it in like a, a more um, medical term for like, you know, embodied issue. It'd be like, why why are you riffing off of a doctor in 1950s for brain surgery? Like, like our technology Absolutely. has changed, how we understand the brain has changed, our procedures have yeah. changed. Like, <laughs> you know, you're, you're a little late yes. to the party here using that. Yeah, okay, it makes sense. Hi friends, if you're enjoying this video, I have a favor to ask. The New Evangelicals is a 501c3 nonprofit, and if you've looked around at all, you've probably noticed that we don't offer member subscriptions on YouTube or Patreon options. The reason for this is very simple. It's been our mission since the beginning to offer all of our content and community resources completely paywall free. What this means is that we are completely dependent on the generosity of people like you who donate to make this work possible and accessible for all. If our content has helped you, would you consider donating to keep it all going? You can find the link in the description of this video. And to be very clear, this is not about giving to God or something like that. We're not a church and this is not a tithe. The ask is so simple. If our work has helped you, would you be willing to help us make this content accessible to more and more people? All donations made in the US are tax deductible and every bit helps. Thank you for your generosity. Me, yeah. I'm going to back yes. it up 15 seconds so we can get the whole thing in context and then we'll keep it going. Just yeah. that way the audience can kind of hear it. Mm -hmm. Diagnosed and that can be treated with medication and, and surgery for the brain. The mind is something completely different. The mind is transcendent. You can't fix the mind with a chemical. You can wound the brain and that's what's coming out now in psychiatry. You go back to Thomas Saz back in 1957, I think, when he wrote the book, The Myth of Mental Health. He wasn't saying that people don't have problems. What he was saying is they aren't brain problems. So you can't use some kind of chemical as if it were to fix the brain. The, the big deception was there's a chemical imbalance in the brain. We all heard that for decades and decades. Take this medication and it'll fix the chemical imbalance. Okay, let's pause there. Yeah. Two things I want to observe. First off, I just love how Ali mm -hmm. is so like fixed on this conversation. Like, wow, like what truth <laughs> you're giving me. Again, it just right. maybe I'm being too petty, but it's just like it blows my mind that this person speaks as an authoritative figure on things that she knows nothing about. Um, I digress. But so and no. this is a claim, by the way, that a lot of people listening have probably heard t still today and like more evangelical, charismatic evangelical, um, even some reformed spaces, right? Where it's like medication mm -hmm. uh, is not good. Medication is is mm -hmm. not going to fix your mental health issue because, mm -hmm. you know, to John's point, the mind is transcendent and the brain is not. So I saw you yeah. nodding your head a lot just saying, no, no, no. Nah. Give me some, yeah, give me some of like, what, what does medication do? Is it effective? What does the research show? Give me all that stuff. And of course, your thoughts on this. Yeah. So again, we have to go back to the interplay between the brain and the mind. And so yeah. he, he continues to bring up these three different examples, PTSD, OCD, and ADHD. So I'm just using those for the purpose sure. of this conversation. Right. Um, but this would be true for many different mental health diagnoses. But we'll, we'll use ADHD um, because uh, contrary to what he says, there is tons of research that talks about ADHD as absolutely uh, a brain issue. <laughs> it mm. starts in the brain, okay? Mm. And so when we look at uh, what is happening in the brain of somebody with ADHD, there's a lot of executive functioning uh, things that are going on, parts of the brains that are not firing and other parts of the brain that are over firing, right? Things that are yeah underperforming and overperforming at the same thing at the same time. Hmm. What that happens then in the mind, there's things that are over functioning and under functioning. That could be things like racing thoughts or spaciness or what might appear as laziness or um we would just call it like over functioning, under functioning, if we're just giving some very general terms here. Yeah, that makes sense. And that, yeah. And so what happens then when we introduce a medication, for example, it impacts the brain to uh, turn on the right wiring system. And I just want you to know, I'm, I'm talking in very general terms so that people can understand. Which uh, uh, Let that, me just say, on behalf of the community and myself, yeah. I sincerely yeah. appreciate. So please keep so, it coming, just like that. So, so we're, I'm, I'm we're totally tracking. I'm totally tracking. We're basically turning the volume up 
on, on the things that so that the right functioning can happen. And we're turning the volume down on the distractions, right? So the distractions, we're turning them down and the volume turning up so that we can concentrate and focus on the things that we need to. What that helps then with the mind is that, okay, now I might not have the racing thoughts. Now I might not have to see squirrels everywhere around yeah. me yeah. so that I can actually focus on things. So we see the brain and the mind are connected here. And that's coming from what he's calling a chemical or a right. pill, a, a medication, right? So this idea that you can't use a chemical to fix the mind, I go, I don't really buy that. Now, could somebody make a, a an argument to say, well, maybe that's not a long term solution? I suppose. Yes. I mean, I, I would actually be of the camp that would say for a lot of mental health issues, perhaps medication is not the long term solution for every single person. But I think that it could be a tool in a toolkit for a lot of people for at least a period of time. And I'll talk about why that is in a second. Um, but I think for him to make this statement that like you can't use medicine to fix the mind, just in that little tiny example, no, I, I think that is categorically wrong and can be refuted easily with just a little bit of research. So what I'm hearing you say, and just make sure I'm, I'm, I'm grabbing this, essentially is that mm -hmm. you know, in one sense, if the mind is transcendent, like how we talked about, I, you, you can make the connection that, 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 that maybe there's no direct pill that goes right to the mind, but it goes to the brain, mm -hmm. which affects how the mind would think. Is that fair? Absolutely. And then I almost Absolutely. thought about it like, you know, almost like a circuit board, like, like, like your breaker system in your house, you always different yes. switches. This is on, this is off. And with mm -hmm. ADHD, sometimes some, some of the wrong things could be on too much voltage and some things could much. be completely off. And then medication yes. kind of helps us regulate that, which mm -hmm. in effect regulates the lighting in our house, right? Or, or how our mind Great way to think that, of it. Right? Okay, that's helpful. Yes. And so I get yeah. that. Can I play devil's advocate for a second about this? Sure. Do you think? Absolutely. Do you think that it is fair to at least? And I'm. This is not. I don't want to give any credit here to Ali or John because because this is not their approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. If it was, I would be a little bit different. Uh, it, we would be having the conversation. Do you think that there mm -hmm. is room for discussion on the idea of people being over medicated or too quick to be prescribed yes. medication? Is that a is Absolutely. that a, a real conversation happening in the community? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it is. So I, by nature, tend to be a holistic person. Yeah, I, I like I take like what I would call like a toolkit approach or a holistic approach. So I go, hey, when we are looking at a person, we're looking at the whole person. So we're right. looking at probably lifestyle changes, environmental changes, relational changes, coping skills. No more caffeine. Um, I mean, honestly, Which will you? I will yeah, never you, let go of my caffeine. <laughs> but for some, for but some yeah, people, yeah. that's not an option, and that's okay. For myself, right. I knew what my body felt like, and I said, "Hey, I can make this change for myself. That works for other right. people. It doesn't. That's okay. But right. it worked for me. Got it. Um, and so I had to make certain changes, and my my personal medication dosage, as a result, is very very low mm. because I've chosen to do other things and I can take a very short acting medication and it works for my body. Right. For other people, they go, hey, I have some other things going on. That doesn't work for me. Cool. Okay. And so, so I would agree with you that I do think that there are certain people, whether it's because of other extenuating factors, the doctors that they're working with, um, that, that would say, yep, you know what? I am going to just kind of rush to this, met this, this pill and that's just what I'm going to go with. I also want to make room for the fact that sometimes medication is the easiest and the cheapest option. Mm. If you don't have access to therapy right, and you do have an insurance that will give you a medicine for $4 a month. Right. Okay. Right. Like that might be the best yeah. option. Yeah. Um, or yeah. So, I mean, I think and that, that opens there's a up lot a whole of different, different factors. Kind of and that opens, right. opens up a whole different can of worms that we can talk maybe back on the podcast about just the inequality yeah. of our American healthcare system and right. the convenience right. versus you know the, treating the whole body. And I think those are all fair yeah. things, especially when it comes to our kids. Right? I mean, I have two kids. Right. I believe you yes. have children as well, Laura. Is that correct? 
Just a dog. You have, okay, you have a dog. <laughs> who would, I apologize. Who would actually benefit from ADHD medication? I've learned about that, by the way. I've learned that dogs can take medication, which blew my mind. But, you know, as someone who's a parent, I obviously want to make sure I'm getting my kids the right kind of help. Yeah. I don't want them, yeah. you know, uh, overly medicated. But if my right. child is having ADHD tendencies, what can yes. we do? And I think that's all fair. Mm-hmm. But this conversation mm-hmm. so far is very much framed as – um, mm-hmm. Medication won't fix anything. It, it's almost very yeah. much this is a worldly perspective. And as we're going to see in this yes. video, John's prescription mm-hmm. is not very helpful. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. And part of it and part of the reason is because he has no understanding of what mental health disorders are. Because right. you can't just say this stuff is trash and then also these things don't exist. Right. Like that is like you can't you can't do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, it's we'll just, keep it going. Yeah, this is yeah. this is really good. I, again, I appreciate your wisdom and insight here. It's super helpful. Mm-hmm. Well, they're now admitting that that was all a useful lie. That there, there's no way to wait. Define. Hold on. Let me let me back this up in context. <laughs> and then, and, yeah, and then we'll get back to that. So here, here here's where we are. I'm going to back it up, friends, a few mm-hmm. minutes or a few seconds so you can hear it. Here we saying go. that people don't have problems. Mm-hmm. What he was saying is they aren't brain problems. So you can't use some kind of chemical as if it were to fix the brain. The, the big deception was there's a chemical imbalance in the brain. We all heard that for decades and decades. Take this medication and it'll fix the chemical imbalance. Well, they're now admitting that that was all a useful lie. Yeah, I mean, who there, is that? There's who no is that? way to define people's difficulty in dealing with the issues of life as a brain problem. It's, it's a mind problem. Okay, well, we'll pause it right here. So the claim is, hey, Allie, um, <laughs> you've been taught this your whole life that that you know this is a chemical imbalance, and they have just have we found out that mm-hmm. they have admitted it's a lie. What? <laughs> just give us what does the research say? Like, like who the heck knows who they is? Do chemical I, imbalances yeah. exist? I mean, you you're the pro here. What do you think? Yes, they absolutely exist, <laughs> and yes, there's so much <laughs> research to back this up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and love it. part of it is we okay, and w- one of, what the research does suggest is we are currently living in a time with an extreme amount of stressors, right. uh, whether that is environmental stressors, financial stressors. Uh, we've got oppressive systems, things like patri- uh, patriarchal systems, uh, racism, uh, capitalism, all these different systems that are right. built on oppression, right? And so we're living in this time. And then we've got hustle culture and cancel yep. culture and yep. political system, all these things yep. that are placing stresses on our bodies, on our nervous systems and physiology that as humans, when we were first created, like we didn't have those stressors. And so hmm. our bodies were not necessarily designed to deal with the stress that we are currently handling. Yeah. So yeah, there are a lot of chemical imbalances that is currently being studied and new research is coming out every single day Wow! that is talking about, hey, this is what we're seeing, you know, differences in our brain, in our body, in our physiology all of the time due to just the environmental stressors that, yes, is absolutely chemical stress, like chemical yeah. imbalances yeah. in our bodies. Even things that, you know, like we would have no control over, like what's being sprayed on our foods and pesticides totally. to help them grow totally. that is impacting the chemical imbalances in our brains that we – Literally, unless we are growing our own foods and controlling yeah. every aspect of yep. that, we are being impacted and our brains and bodies are as well. So think for about him even to, um, microplastics. Yeah. Yeah. Microplastics Absolutely. are everywhere. They, they literally yes. found them in someone's testicles. Okay. Yes. Like that, that is like real recently. Research. This right, is in recently. the last couple of weeks. So we, yes. we to your yeah. point, there are, and yeah. I think this is one of the problems of like our, our, our hyper individualist culture and also yeah. the evangelical culture that, that can't see the, the interconnectedness of all things is that yeah. we're kind of living in an ecosystem that's almost built like our brain. It's tons of of synthetic yeah. of wires and and, and uh, mm-hmm. neurons and, and, and highways of interconnectedness, yes, right? Absolutely. And so that, that yeah. exists beyond what's happening inside our head, and we are a part of that. And so yeah. our we're I don't know. I don't, I don't have yeah. the right words to express it, but we're we're kind of I felt I feel like in yeah. a very delicate balance of how everything is in harmony. And once mm-hmm. one thing gets out of whack, it affects things that we don't even know are being affected, yes. right? And so yes. it's very reasonable mm-hmm. to think, to your point, between the chemicals that are in our, mm-hmm. in, in, in our 
in our drinks and our food and the air we're breathing mm-hmm. and all of this other, other problems, plus the, just the stress of trying to grow up and yeah. live in 2024 mm-hmm. America, where most of us can't yes. get affordable health care or whatever else it is, right? Absolutely. That, of course, yeah. we're going to have a chemical imbalance in our brain. Yeah. Uh, that's not, yeah. that's almost to be expected. I guess the oddity would be if someone didn't have one. Like, whoa, you're not affected by yeah. any of this? Like, how? <laughs> Tell me everything. How? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's and don't say you pray a lot. Like, if you say you pray exactly. a lot, I swear. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Very exactly. Fair. Yeah. Okay. You want to keep mm-hmm. moving on then for a little bit? See let's, where we go? Let's go. Yeah. Right, let's, let's see go. what This is next. fun. It's so much fun. <laughs> it's very different. So what I was saying was, is there post-traumatic, pro- post-traumatic stress? Of course. Is it a brain syndrome? No. Can I just bring something very a uh, minor point? Notice how he will acknowledge the category. So he acknowledged mm-hmm. that PTSD is real because, mm-hmm. again, we have now to be what, right because. <laughs> but he, well, uh, yes, yes, he does now. He's ripping off of modern science and medicine mm-hmm. and then says, but it's not a brain problem. So he's willing yeah. to acknowledge the category that modern science has given him and yeah. then reject the research behind it, showing how it affects yeah. the brain and saying, but it's mm-hmm. not a brain problem. Could you, I, I'm right. sorry, can we just say, yeah. could you imagine, um, Laura, <laughs> if you were on someone else's show and you were presenting mm-hmm. as like a computer expert, you're like, yeah, listen, yeah. here's how it works. Okay, you got, you yeah. got your <laughs> GPUs and your CPUs <laughs> and uh, this, this modern science, it's all garbage. Like if we just connected a yeah. few things here or there on the motherboard, we'd be good. People would be like, yeah. who is this person? Like that, that's how exactly. John sounds, I feel like, like to you, where it's like, John, you're so clearly not qualified. You know yes. so little about this, but because you are a pastor, and frankly, people yeah. have been bowing down to you for decades, calling you America's decades, faithful yeah. gospel preacher. It's gotten yeah. into your head where you think you can just speak about anything, and somehow your opinion is right over the yeah. actual data of the topic that you're critiquing. Yes. Mind yes. blowing. My mind is yes. blown. <laughs> it is. It is so ridiculous. And Jeez. yeah, and and to to acknowledge the category, yeah, yes, it exists. But not to acknowledge the most basic research about that category. Because if he's just going to say, yes, it exists, like the next level down is that it's a brain <laughs> issue. Like, I, like okay, then what? Well, he, t- he tells us what he thinks it is. But OK, <laughs> you know, like I I'm just am so curious to know where he gets his research. But yes, yeah, I digress. I'm, I'm right there with you. It's it's. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. All right, here, here we go. So, so, John, what is it? Yeah, yeah. We're going to find out. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're going to find out in a minute here. <laughs> PhD, are there kids who have trouble paying attention, uh, trouble sitting still? Yeah, I was one of them. Is it a brain problem? No. Uh, what about uh, obsessive compulsive problems? Is that a brain disorder? No. But part of the culture's bent is to say, hey, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. You've got a disorder. Yeah. You, you've got a disorder. You can have a brain disorder, but but that's not what they're talking about. Like, Pete- this is a very classic mm-hmm. John MacArthur, mm-hmm. um, Bill Gothard kind of approach, right? Where yeah. where he thinks that because you could have a, be, he thinks if you admit that mm-hmm. you have a brain chemical imbalance, um, somehow that automatically absolves. Uh, people from personal responsibility. So for him, he thinks it's one or the right. other. Like it's not both and, yeah. right? It, it's either yeah. you have to own your own mental health or or whatever you think, it, yeah. or, or or own your mind mm-hmm. problems and, and get them fixed. Probably probably by going to my church and tithing and praying. Um, or if you <laughs> if you go if you go down if you go down the world's path, you're just you're just trying to be yeah. a victim. This is all just victim blaming. You know, oh, right. oh woe is me. I, everything, right. nothing's your yeah. fault. And that's kind of John's yeah. pr- pr- approach here. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. classic. Yeah, it's it is so bizarre to me because again, I mean, I know I keep going back to the research, but like it feels so important to me because I think I grew up so many years of my life just being told like you just listen to the person in authority and like reject everything else that totally. even though it's like telling a totally different set of facts or whatever, but I mean, literally just for anybody listening, that's like, I mean, is he right? Like, is it not just literally do a Google search, just quickly Google, like, is PTSD a brain disorder is ADHD is, you know, OCD. It's like every single one of them will say, yes, it is like, here's, here's like the top article, you know, it's like, anyways, all of that to say, it's like 
all of the research, PTSD, it's like, it is a physiological disorder that starts, it's, it's like in your nervous system, starts in your brainstem with your reptil, the reptilian part of your brain that is scanning for danger. And it finds a threat real perceived or remembered and sets an alarm off in your body that mobilizes your entire body into making sure that you're safe and it changes your brain. Like, okay, there, the research is all there. But then I, th- I don't know if he already said it or talking about it, like this idea that it's grief. And I, I'm just, I don't know where he gets all of this stuff, but this idea, yeah, like you're saying that, you know, he's just boiling it down to this, you know, idea that people are just using it as an excuse. Like, you know, society just says, oh, it's not your fault, right? It's not exactly. your fault. Exactly, exactly. And Be- because I, him and, oh, sorry, go ahead. I don't cut you off. I was, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, I, I agree to an extent, like, we should not use our diagnoses as a fault to be shitty people. Totally. Right? It's like, <laughs> like 100%. I, when people are like, well, I'm an Enneagram 8, so of course I'm combative. Right. Or this or that, right? Like, yeah, right. no, you're just being a shitty human being. Like, you right, shouldn't yeah, be that just way. Just being a jerk, yeah. But, yeah, like, but in my experience when i'm working with clients or when i've received a diagnosis myself the sigh of relief that i've felt or that my clients have felt in saying oh my god there's not something wrong with me right like this helps me organize my experiences and actually live a fuller life knowing that oh i just need to make some accommodations for myself and i can actually be okay It helps them take more responsibility for themselves and know how to function as a whole human being. Yeah. It changes everything. And yeah, I agree. We, we need to take responsibility for ourselves. We don't need to say like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to treat you poorly because of this thing. No, we don't need to do that to people. So yeah, we do, we do have to take the responsibility, but most people with mental health issues the, I mean, not everybody, but most people aren't using that to play the victim card. Right. Like, right. Yes. They're using it to try. They're 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 seeking mental health care to try to live a fuller and more whole life. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I'm I'm 100 percent with you all the way on this. Um, yeah, absolutely. Let's keep it going here and see what else he has to say. We're almost done with oh, the clip. John. PSD is really <laughs> grief. It's horrendous grief. It's uh, survival guilt. It's having watched your buddies blown to pieces. You can't, you got to deal with that grief. But putting a chemical into your body that will alter your brain, that's what's becoming the issue now. And there are lots of psychiatrists who are being honest for the first time. Okay, let's pause it here for a second. So he (laughs) says that PTSD is just immense grief and he gives some very he talks about you know he gives examples about seeing things in war obviously right which is a real Mm -hmm. thing obviously i've learned and again i'm not the expert here so you can correct me that ptsd is wider than that it can mean other things as Mm -hmm. well can you just kind of give us the crash course on the difference between deep grief and actual ptsd and then maybe we'll we'll respond to the end of who these psychologists are that are coming out uh like who who are who like people in your (laughs) master's seminary program uh that are like now licensed by the you know I, th- I think it's called the master seminary so like is, are those uh-huh, people you're talking is. about yeah. because that that's not they're not really very credible john <laughs> so, yeah uh, anyway go ahead <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so again he's referencing a very outdated uh definition of what trauma is so back in the day so we're talking <laughs> like 19 1980s and before we're looking at trauma as an event that happened and it was considered like a catastrophic event usually things like war natural disaster uh sexual uh, instances of sexualized violence prior yeah. to the mid 80s early 90s really anything like that in 1992 seminal research came out by judith herman which was really talking about more what we understand trauma today with complex trauma recognizing trauma is not in the event itself but rather the way that our body and our nervous system responds to the event uh, or the thing that happened to us so that trauma is subjective it's not the thing that happens to us Mm. but the way that our body responds to the thing that happens to us which means that there is no 
one thing that is inherently traumatic. Um, what may be traumatic for you may or may not be for me and vice versa. It's There's a number of factors that are subconscious and unique to each individual that would determine if something results in trauma. That's everything from our history to our genetics to our access to safety and coping skills and history and all sorts of different things. Yeah. And that can even vary from sibling to sibling, mm, wow. right? Yeah, and so um, so there's that piece of it. So he's referencing something. He's referencing research that's just widely right. outdated. It's like blind, it's um, like buying a black and white TV. Like I guess you could, but why? <laughs> you why? could. We yeah, have HD yeah. now, John. Widescreen 4K. Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. It's going to a doctor who's still practicing uh, brain surgery methods from the 1950s. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Right? Yeah. Cool. 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 Okay. Cool. cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. So we've got that. And we also have then, you know, we, we recognize that grief is oftentimes a, a part of the trauma recovery process. Makes sense. But to suggest that they are one in the same is pretty reductionistic. Mm. Um, now, obviously, if you are, in his example here, in war and you're watching your comrades being killed, the likelihood that you would experience a deep sense of grief and or survivor's guilt is probably pretty high. Right. Likely. Right. right. Um, and and you would likely go through a process of grief maybe for years or the rest of your life even um, and would never want to minimize that. We right. also would not want to reduce that the only thing coming back from war right. would be that. Right. Right. That makes complete so sense. I think that's where we would want to say it, it, so to say it's just that would would also then say so any other physiological symptoms you would have any other standards of care the um kind of other traumatology standards that you would have or diagnostic criteria that goes along with the diagnosis of ptsd or cptsd that doesn't really exist you just have some deep grief and survivor's guilt right yeah right yeah that, makes sense. that right pretty reductionistic yeah yeah, yeah. no that, that's very helpful <clears throat> excuse me and as <clears throat> hold on <clears throat> Woo! all right i'm all right as far as his claim about you know psychologists coming out saying uh you know they're exposing this i mean i can you think of anyone who's like who's like really in the field who's like actually guys i'm i'm with john on this like we've got it all backwards chemical imbalances aren't a thing <laughs> and ptsd is just grief and you know yada 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 i mean honestly is there anyone out there who's saying this that, that is like well respected in the field i'm not talking about some random <laughs> guy on youtube you know but like a yeah. serious well, credentialed person yeah. Well respected is going to be the key there. I did look up. He mentioned some guy. I looked him up. Not that I am the barometer for like, if I haven't heard of him, then nobody has. Totally. Um, he meant, you know, he mentioned somebody I have never heard of him. I looked him up to see like, hey, you know, have I heard of his books or anything like that? Or have I even heard of any of the people who have endorsed his books? I haven't. Um, so I again, I'm not the barometer of right, if this right. person is a quack or not, but I, I usually do look to see like where are any connections, and I haven't. I, I don't have any, and I would say when I look at, especially in the fields of trauma, who are the leading researchers? Where are the where where are things coming out of? Who are the people that are being sought after to do the talks? Who are coming out with the cutting edge stuff? No, that's not what they're saying at all. Well, I, I can't say I'm surprised. And again, you know, we do we, <laughs> yeah. we do our best to be as um, mm -hmm. we do our best to assume positive yeah. intent as much as we can. But mm -hmm. given how much I know about John MacArthur and what he said before, and how he operates, I would not be at mm -hmm. all surprised to find out that, that, that the person he's citing is someone in the same world he occupies with the same biblical <laughs> worldview, same understanding right. of, of of the need of patriarchy and the need mm -hmm. for women to stay underneath their husbands. Like, like I would just imagine that 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 that, mm -hmm. that the whole worldview is baked into whoever John is citing as a credible source on this, frankly, because John yeah. is very much the epitome of, of a fundamentalist, not just like, we're not talking about a, a conservative yeah. evangelical, they're different. 
This is a fundamentalist approach, which essentially mm -hmm. says the worldview I hold is all that really exists or that is true. So yeah, maybe other mm -hmm. ways of seeing the world exist, but they're not true like mine. And so I couldn't imagine John citing someone who would have a different worldview than him on this topic mm -hmm. um, as yeah. in, in him saying, hey, listen, even this other person agrees with me and he, he doesn't agree with me on anything else. I don't see yeah. that as being the case yeah. based on what I know yeah. of John MacArthur. And what I will say too, even in the psychological and academic communities of the trauma world and psychology world, there is a more fundamentalist side and a more kind of what I would consider an eclectic side. And yeah. even the more fundamentalist side would not come close to agreeing with what okay. MacArthur is saying. Good to know. Um, be because none of the research would, would go in that right, direction. Right, because you want to be data driven, not dogma driven. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. yeah that makes yeah, sense. Okay. Absolutely. We'll mm -hmm. keep her going then. Here we go. There's a there's mm -hmm. a book that's very helpful. It's called A Profession Without Reason mm -hmm. by Bruce Levine. That's and what he basically yeah, that's what he says find. is that the psychology and psychiatry has been trying to deal with mind problems with things that alter the brain. They don't fix the mind problems, but the emotional issues, but they do negatively impact the brain. That's all I was saying. Yeah. If you want to solve yeah. your mm -hmm. mind problems, you've got to find love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Those are spiritual virtues that are ah, available there it is. in Christ. Yeah. Don't turn to chemicals, <laughs> turn to Christ. Okay, yeah, this this is very, very classic here, right? Because, and, and also think mm -hmm. about uh, about the fruit of John's ministry, especially for mm -hmm. folks who are not white, able-bodied men. Right. Think about right. Eileen Gray, who was shamed yeah. by John publicly for not returning to her husband who was abusing her mm -hmm. and her kids and who was later found out to be molesting their kids. Right. Is there love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness in that, John? Yeah. You know, and, and, and that for me, perhaps is the, is the most smoking is the biggest smoking gun. Mm -hmm. I, I might even have a, a shred more of empathy or understanding for someone who really tried to embody the fruit of the spirit and say this is the solution. I would have problems mm -hmm. with it, but I would at least understand what they're trying to do. John's worldview, mm -hmm. John's ethics. John's perspectives on things like slavery, if you ever read them or, or listen to them, are the freaking yeah. opposite of everything John just said in the very end. Because for John, turning to Christ really means turning to him and how he understands mm -hmm. theology, salvation, the Bible, etc. And the mm -hmm. proof is in, is in the history. It's in the receipts. It harms mm -hmm. people who are not like him. It only helps people yeah. who assimilate into his worldview, their hierarchy, their patriarchy, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so reductionistic. <clears throat> it does not take the human experience into consideration yeah. at all. Yeah. And I think that one of the first things that I learned in like literally day one of my therapy training, like at, at Liberty University of all places, which is where I went for my wow. master's degree. Wow. Um, shockingly was like not because it wasn't a Christian counseling program. Um, it was it was, you know, regular therapy program. Yeah. Um, but it blew open my world because it was all about not putting people into these boxes. And I was like, well, if that's true, if what my professor is saying is true, then I have to rethink everything because right. it means that all these boxes that I've been told people fit into, they don't. And that means all these other things also don't fit. And what he's trying to do here is put people back into these boxes and saying, essentially, <clears throat> if you just conform your mind back into this box. Yes. Here's these qualities, just like set your mind on love and patience, the fruits of the spirit, right? And if you do that, then you won't have these problems. And yet we right. know that simply dwelling on those things does not decrease anxiety and depression and OCD and ADHD symptoms. And they might mask them for a little bit, but all of the research talks about like, like that doesn't get rid of them. It actually increases them. Like untreated ADHD does not go away. Yes. Trauma does not heal. Untreated trauma does not heal over time. It mm. gets worse. Wow. Like, yeah. And so I think that like, that's important for people to know because I mean, I, I know for myself, it's like, okay, well, I was highly anxious in those systems. And so I would just repeat Bible verses over and over and over. That's all I had at my disposal. Yeah. I, my anxiety did not go away. It got worse. Right. Same, same. 
right? (laughs) And and we need to let people know that that's not a problem with you. That's not you not setting your mind on the things above. Right. There's some things going on because of what's happening in your brain. And there's things that can help you, not because you are a bad, evil, sinful person. This actually isn't a sin issue. Right. There's other things that are happening and there is support. Right. Is 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 running and breaking your leg a sin issue? No. Right. Right? I mean getting into a car accident, is that a sin issue? No. No. Unless, I mean, unless yeah. you're drinking or driving or something, obviously. But, you, well, but the sure. idea of it in and of itself is no, it's not. Why do we see anxiety mm-hmm. or OCD or PTSD mm-hmm. as oh, it's a sin issue? It makes no. When you really mm-hmm. examine the claims, broadly speaking, of evangelicalism and mental health, it doesn't really yeah. add up. But when you're in it, it's very compelling, right? Because exactly. they sell spirituality as the one-stop shop to fix every problem you might be having, whether it's financial, right. whether it's your attitude, your outlook on life. And of course, for some people, your physical healing. So of course, why, mm-hmm. why would a mental health be there as well, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But the reality is to your point, and I, I, I'm, I don't know, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but my understanding is a healthy sense of religiosity, a healthy understanding of a God who loves you and accepts you and wants to connect with you can actually definitely benefit someone's overall mental health if used in conjunction with mm-hmm. other things. But that's not a silver bullet to solve or to to, mm-hmm. to, to manage, you know, things like anxiety. Mm-hmm. I mean, my, my, my the first time I went to a licensed psychologist, not a Christian one, he said, listen, you might just have to learn how to how to how to how to cope with and manage your anxiety. It might never go away. And I was like, well, uh, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. What do you mean it might never go away? You know, like I thought I just read some Bible yeah. verses, or it's a matter of time. And he's like, no, like it, you might be able, you might you might develop tools to manage it well, and you might mm-hmm. develop a way to even get comfortable with it. And when you get comfortable, then it will tend to dissipate, but it's still going to be there. And honestly, he's mm-hmm. right. The sooner I actually embraced, and now I'm talking about for me. This is not yes. mental health advice and. Dr. Laura, you, you, you can correct me wherever you see needed. But for me, the minute I said, you know what, instead of trying to fight my, and I was having some pretty intense anxiety, I mean, really intense, mm-hmm. ruminating, ruminating thoughts, all that stuff. The sooner I said, you know what, maybe it's about learning how to live with this and to see it and to see my yes. body, you know, trying to protect me and, and, and being grateful for that. Maybe the sooner I do that, the sooner this stuff will start to be you know, not really a thought in my head. And it took a lot of time. Mm-hmm. It was not overnight. It was not a silver bullet. But man, that I look back now several years later yeah. and think that was the moment where things started to really change, where I stopped resisting and just tried to embrace. Yes. And that was yeah. a huge game changer for me personally. Again, not for everyone yeah. else. Please see your, your therapist or whoever you need to. Yeah. But for me, it was really helpful. Yeah. No, I think you're right. When we stop resisting things, like oftentimes they become smaller. There's a whole other, like those are other conversations. And yeah, if your religion is the thing that's teaching you that you have to resist because it's a sin thing, then we have the added layer of shame that's on top of it because Mm. it's like a holy thing. And so, yeah, if that version of God is the one that's like condemning you and, you know, doing this, that's where the religiosity piece can be actually negatively impacting the mental health piece. If you can work, if you're, if you can allow yourself of God or your view of God to expand into something different where God yeah. is with you in a more supportive way, then actually God can be the supportive factor that research does talk about as being what we would call a pro-social supportive factor yes. rather yes. than what high control religion and fundamentalism really yeah. would be more of a risk factor yeah. that increases negative mental health, you know, symptoms and, and shame and and trauma. I mean, what we're talking about here, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. All right. So on yeah. a scale of one to ten, what would you rate John <laughs> MacArthur's mental health advice? Uh ten being, wow, oh, John, God. you're really you you know your shit. <laughs> or, you know, zero being like um, avoid this man at, yes. at, at every possible turn on any of this stuff. Where would you rate him? It, numbers below zero. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Yes. In uh, well, the you negatives. Heard it here. Negatives. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Why not? <laughs> uh, Dr. Laura Anderson, this was, it was great having you on to unpack oh, this. So I, good to I, be I, here. It's great. Where can folks find your work? I mean, you have a pretty decent public platform. You're out there doing stuff. So where can folks follow you and find Mm -hmm. you? 
yeah, I'm across all platforms at Dr. Laura E. Anderson. That's my website as well. And then I run the tra uh, Center for Trauma Resolution and Recovery. Our website is traumaresolutionandrecovery.com. And uh, we are a trauma resolution and recovery across all platforms as well. Awesome. I love it. We'll definitely keep in touch. And I'm sure we'll do another one of these at some point in the future. Yes. Awesome. Thanks. Great to talk. You too.